Um, I just want to welcome you this morning uh, to this call. Um, make sure, can you hear me okay? Thumbs up. Okay. Um, we're having some connectivity issues over here. I uh, just want to welcome you to this call this morning uh, held uh, together in conjunction with uh, the Center for Leadership Development and the Center for Missional Outreach uh, to talk about our missional responses uh, in particular uh, to hear from some medical uh, experts uh, that are connected to us uh, and help us think about the um, medical responses and pastoral care uh, uh, issues that we are going to need to think about over uh, the next uh, couple weeks and, and moving beyond. Uh, so we're really glad to have uh, with us um, Dr. Joseph Kurdaki, uh, who is a pulmonologist. Sure. Thank you for being here. And a pulmonologist uh, who's associated with uh, Christ UMC in Plano. Um, and a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Brittany Balo. Are you on, on the call, Brittany? I was having trouble getting in touch with her this morning. Uh, so she may join us a little bit later, and she is a surgeon with Baylor, Scott, and White here in Grapevine, and has pulled together a lot of uh, research uh, that's been very helpful for a, a lot of us. Um, before we move farther, though, I want to point to you, um, point out to you on your chat function, if you're with us uh, via the computer, uh, you will find an attachment, and I'll... Um, reattach it at the end in case you haven't found it. But it's an attachment that has all of the Zoom call links for uh, the Zoom calls that will be happening throughout this week um, to talk about how the resources that we're going to need uh, from various centers to talk about issues of how do we um, really talk about staffing issues, uh, finances, thinking about the stimulus uh, bill that has uh, come out and how churches and nonprofits might be able to take advantage of those things. Um, so take a look at that. Uh, it's the same as the email you will receive from the conference as well. And I will reattach that toward the end. Um, so um, Reverend Kami Gaston, would you open us in prayer? from Father Richard Rohr. Let us pray. O oh, great God of love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from your deep connection with you and all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and the weights of your glory. Listen to our hearts longing for the healing of the world. And as we share our own prayers, Lord, in this silent time, um, we lift them up to you. Lord, I pray for those who are feeling the fear of what might happen to our own health, to our hospitals, to our doctors and nurses, to our caregivers, and our loved ones. Help us have strength and courage. Lord, we give you thanks for the gifts of our hospitals, our doctors and nurses, and we pray that we would support them, Lord, in the many ways that they need support. And now knowing that you hear all of us better than we even speak, we offer you all of these prayers in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Cammie. Um, the plan for today's conversation is uh, to have kind of a panel conversation um, in which we'll engage around some questions that uh, we've kind of worked out in conjunction with conversations with uh, our medical professionals here, um, and then be able to um, uh, go into a time where uh, where Cami is going to lead us in a, a conversation about the role of pastor in the midst of a crisis like this, and uh, hopefully we can have some time to have some breakout conversation where um, where we can be together at least in 
uh, some breakout rooms to share um, what we're um, thinking about in this time and how we're approaching some of these conversations and issues of care. Uh, and then we'll be able to have some follow-up questions and some questions and answer uh, times with us. Um, Dr. Sudaki, what, uh, what does your time look like this morning with us? I know I'm good. I, I've, I've kind of uh, cleared out some time and I've got my staff handling things. So, you know, I got an hour or two, uh, you know, so we're, we're good. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for your time this morning. Um, so on this call are a, a variety of pastors and, and lay uh, leaders um, who are responding not only to the needs of their congregation, uh, but to the needs of their community. Um, for our conversations, uh, it's clear that uh, there's some sobering facts that many of us probably need to hear. Some of us may have already heard. Uh, about what we might be able to expect over the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, from where you sit, what are you seeing and, and what should we know as we go about approaching this? Uh, well, just if we could start just with uh, some of the, uh, the medical aspects of this, um, you've probably heard a lot of this already before on the, on the news, but just I think uh, probably the three biggest issues issues going on with why this is such a big crisis is, first of all, uh, we're dealing with a, um, a virus that is highly contagious, uh, as opposed to some other viruses we've had in the past, uh, SARS, MERS, et cetera. Uh, it is also a novel virus. You've heard that term used before, novel. Uh, the term novel simply means new. It's a new virus. And the two issues that go with uh, a new virus is, uh, first of all, we don't know a lot about it. We don't know a lot about um, uh, how, you know, uh, how long this may go on. Uh, we don't know if warm weather will affect this. Um, you know, what I've said to people before, the best way to describe what the epidemiologists are doing right now and what the World Health Organization, et cetera, um, is imagine your mechanic trying to uh, diagnose a problem with your car and work on your car while you're driving on the highway. Uh, that's essentially what these professionals are doing and trying to figure out what's going on with this virus. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, plus the fact that it's novel is nobody has any immunity to it. Nobody in the world has immunity to this. So it's being introduced into a population that has never seen this virus before, which is why we are so concerned about uh, the cases uh, exceeding our uh, healthcare uh, limitations. Uh, the other thing is we're seeing a greater morbidity and mortality. Morbidity meaning the severity of the illness, mortality meaning uh, basically the fatality rate. And we don't really even know what those numbers are. The numbers really vary from one country to another. The mortality is varying between about 1% and 10% from one part region of the world to another. We don't know what those factors are, and honestly, we're not going to know what those factors are until after the pandemic is over and the epidemiologists and the statisticians can really start to look into what all the different factors were around the world uh, that uh, uh, caused these changes. Uh, so this is why this is such a crisis. It's why the medical community has been scared of this and, and concerned about this for the last several months. So. Uh, trying to get into some of the, the medical aspects that affect uh, more the pastoral care, you know, the psychosocial aspects of it, the spiritual aspects of it. Um, I've been th thinking about this for quite some time, and I can, yeah, I think we can start obviously with the isolation factor. People are, um, uh, are being stuck at home. In some cases, that's a wonderful thing. I have uh, a new daughter in law who my son and daughter in law are living with us right now. Uh, they weren't planning on living with us this long, but they're kind of stuck with us. So I've gotten to know my daughter-in-law a lot better, but for some people, uh, the isolation is very difficult. Um, I was just on the phone yesterday with a friend of mine who's a, a single man living in uh, Fort Worth, and we've all been trying to call him uh, to make sure he's doing well because there's an enormous social isolation that goes along with this. Uh, obviously, the other part of that is that uh, there's been mention of um, you know, dysfunctional families and domestic violence, and uh, what are the factors uh, going on there with uh, the stress of, of social isolation? 
what are happening to families who are having to deal with uh, this dysfunction on a much more intense level. Um, those are things uh, I even heard that brought up uh, yesterday when uh, Andrew Cuomo was uh, giving his press conference and what New York State is trying to do in regards to, uh, to those issues. Um, when it comes to healthcare workers, um, you know, speaking from my own experience, I did 25 years of, of critical care. And just three years ago, I basically gave up doing critical care and decided at my age, I just needed to stay in the office. Um, but uh, I can tell you that uh, doing critical care and taking care of patients uh, in severe circumstances is ex extremely stressful. And one of the interesting things that I found in my own career was that um, as I went through my training and as I started doing more and more in my career, uh, the, stress level, the stress level increased dramatically uh, over time, but not so dramatically over a period of time. It was very, very slow. And, and so you become more adaptive to it. You, you learn how to deal with the severe illness and, uh, and death. Um, but not in this kind of quantity. Uh, what's happening right now is uh, really unprecedented. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, just some of the videos that I've seen from Italy and, uh, and from New York right now in the emergency rooms and the ICUs, uh, that level of stress is uh, something I can't even imagine at this point. Um, we all adapt to that level of stress, but I can tell you when I stopped going to the hospital, um, it felt like an enormous weight had fallen off my shoulder. And it was something that I never really realized was there until it was gone because it had ramped up over my career for such a long time uh, that it just became you know, part of what I did every day. And once I, I left the, the stress of critical care, uh, I suddenly was able to look back and start to wonder how I ever did it for all those years. Um, my concern with the, with the healthcare workers right now is, you know, it's kind of like the frog in the pot of boiling water. It, it just, uh, the stress increases, you know, bit by bit. And at this point, uh, there may be a point where it's overwhelming to some of the, uh, some of the healthcare workers. But we're trained to keep doing what we do and, and to um, you know, keep our nose to the grindstone and to keep focused on the patient. Uh, but it can be overwhelming at times. And, and again, I can't even imagine what some people are going through right now and having to deal with uh, the level of care and the level of, of uh, death and dying that they're having to see. Um, from a family perspective, uh, one of the very unique things about an infectious disease like this is I know for a fact, talking with some friends around uh, the DFW area, that, that the, uh, the numbers of patients have been increasing, but they're not up to a critical level uh, to this point. I know that some hospitals have been um, uh, setting aside certain blocks of rooms and certain floors and wards in anticipation of the increased numbers. Uh, that are going to be coming in. And uh, that level of, of preparation, um, basically what they're trying to do is, is have um, a specific part of the hospital that's isolated for this virus. Now, what that does is, um, first of all, it decreases the amount of personal protective equipment that's needed. It helps with that supply because uh, the healthcare workers can go in and don the personal protective gear and stay in that area without having to get out in and out of their personal protective gear. Um, when life is normal, we all have a few patients who are in some sort of isolation in the hospital and you will don that personal protective gear before you go in to see that patient. And then what will happen is you will take that gear off when you come out times. But that's uh, very, uh, it's something that can't be done when you're looking at the numbers here. And so what that does in effect is it isolates those patients into a specific ward. And what has happened in those circumstances is that patients' families are unable to communicate with them, are unable to see them because of the need for infection control and to minimize the use of 
uh, personal protective gear because we don't have you know, boxes and boxes that we can just throw away whenever. What's happening is that uh, there's gonna be an isolation between patients who are hospitalized and their families. And it's gonna be in a very intense um, uh, time for them because obviously some of the time we spend um, in the hospital with our family. I know I had surgery last year and my wife basically stayed with me and slept at the hospital the entire time I was there. So she was comfortable being with me and I was there to have her, um, you know, her support. Unfortunately, these people are going to be uh, gravely ill and will have nobody there with them. Um, one side note I wanted to say is that when it comes to, uh, to those of us who work in the healthcare industry, we, we, um, our patients are our patients. They mean a lot to us. So I don't think those patients are ever alone. They may not be with the people that they want to be with. Uh, but we very we care very much about what we do, and we care very much about our patients. But that's going to be an enormous stress, not just for the patients, but it's going to be an enormous stress for the family. Something unprecedented that you won't see every day unless you're in a crisis like this. Um, one other thing that that just struck me over the past few days, too, from personal experience, is uh, the middle of last week. Uh, the billing person in my office developed a fever. And so we sent her home right away and I arranged for her to get uh, tested for the, the COVID virus. And we don't have that, that back yet, but her husband has subsequently become ill. Uh, he was also tested, but um, we don't, and we don't have those results back yet, but we are doing strictly telemedicine right now in our office. And we're, we're kind of isolating from each other and we're isolating from our families because we're fairly sure that she has developed the virus. And she has been doing nothing but apologizing for the last several days because of the, uh, the changes that have occurred to the office. And that brought to mind the idea of blame and guilt that in an unusual situation like this, that uh, people will have a tremendous amount of guilt if they happen to be the person who may have brought the virus home uh, or God forbid um, they got sick and their grandparent got sick and maybe uh, succumbed to the disease. And um, I, you know, I think how people manage that, um, what I've said to my uh, billing person is, look, this is a pandemic. You don't know where this is going to come from. We're all doing our best, but people, in spite of their best efforts and their best behavior, are going to get this disease and are going to get this infection. Uh, and um, I feel sorry for um, for some of the the people that may go through that those waves of of blame and guilt. So those are just some of the things that I've. Uh, that I've sent to uh, Andrew, things I think that are worth discussing in the realm of pastoral care. Yeah, and I believe, um, uh, Dr. Joseph, we've had a couple of pastors just online on our kind of clergy Facebook group um, mention that they've had to deal with some of that isolation um, already. And before we go to, um, to Brittany, I just wanted to ask, uh, we've had some questions about can chaplains who are already a part of hospital staff um, access patients once they're in that kind of quarantine? Um, that's a question for me. I think that might be a better question for Brittany because okay. she's there in the hospital right now. I would think that they can, but she would know what her hospital policy is. Okay. Well, uh, welcome, Brittany, um, uh, who's here with us. Uh, she is a surgeon here at Baylor Scott & White here in Grapevine, and uh, we're so happy to have you here. Unmute. Hi, go. thanks for having me. Sorry, I'm, I've got kids, and obviously I know we're all dealing with this right now, so you might have extra guests today. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I was just listening to kind of the last part of that and I saw the question about chaplains. So I'll go ahead and address that. As far as I know, chaplains are allowed to um, 
kind of access those areas, but I don't know right now how long they'll be able to access the actual patients. Um, right now, like at Grapevine, they're creating COVID floors. So entire floors that used to treat other patients are just COVID patients. Um, and so we try to limit the amount of ins and outs of that unit each day. Um, and, uh, but I do think they have at least a little bit of that available. Um, I know isolation has been really, really hard. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the pictures and things of people kind of meeting outside hospital windows and whatnot. And um, at Baylor Grapevine, you can't even do that because there's nobody on a bottom floor. So um, it's been really, I think that's tough on everybody. It's tough on the healthcare workers too. Um, you're isolated to that unit um, for the whole day on your shift. You, you don't leave. Um, you can't like go down to the cafeteria that you normally would to eat lunch. Um, thankfully you do have some other healthcare workers with you, but obviously it's a very limited staff. Um, so it can be a really, really hard day to be working on that unit. When I see uh, one of our colleagues uh, here, Eric Folkerth from uh, Dallas at Kessler Park is saying that, uh, uh, some chaplains at Methodist Dallas have um, said they're being restricted from COVID patients in that hospital network. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to come down to how many patients you have um, and kind of where they're at and if they're able to be kind of isolated. Um, obviously, we don't want to expose our chaplains either. Um, and so it's kind of hospital system by hospital system. Um, Right now, like I said, I haven't been told that our chaplains are completely restricted, um, but I imagine as our numbers get bigger, they probably will be. Um, and so some other things, I, you know, he just had a lot of good things to say um, that apply to those of us in the hospital, those of us as outpatients, everybody. Um, obviously, this isn't going to um, leave anyone untouched. Um, everyone's going to be affected, whether it's your health or your finances or your loved ones or any of that. So I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. And as healthcare workers, we're kind of doubly affected. Like he said, these are our patients and that's who we care about the most. Um, that's why we've all been just begging people to stay home. Um, we, we don't want this number of patients um, for anybody. And um, we don't want them to be this sick with something that we know so little about. Um, we've come so far in medicine in the last hundred years that, you know, I don't think any of us expected anything like the Spanish flu to come back and get us again. Um, so I think that's kind of the big part of it is that we're just, for our generation, we've never seen anything like this. We've had scares, sure. We've seen SARS, we've seen MERS, we've seen Ebola, we've seen all of that from everywhere else, but especially here in the United States and really much of Europe, um, we've been pretty well protected from massive outbreaks of anything really scary for a for basically any living generation. So, um, you know, again, I do think guilt is a lot of it, and I hate seeing that. Um, I think mental health is going to be a we're gonna have another pandemic when this is all over. And unfortunately, I don't know that it's one that we can avoid. Um, and so we're all gonna need bigger support systems than what we had before. Um, but once we get through this, like I said, no one's gonna be untouched. And so the mental health aspect is gonna be something that's gonna be drastically different. And we already know, um, especially you know, in the United States, but really throughout the world, mental health is not well-funded. Um, there aren't a lot of psychiatrists. There aren't a lot of even like psychotherapists. There's not enough for the world um, as it was, much less now that we have people dealing with acute anxiety that they've never had to deal with before. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects to this that I think are also confounding factors for healthcare workers. Because um, it's scary to walk in the door right now um, to the hospital. And um, you know, I, I went through physician burnout a couple of years ago and there were certain days that I dreaded going to work. Um, this is a whole different kind of dread. Um, it's, am I going to get exposed today? Am I going to potentially cross contaminate someone if I see someone that I didn't know was positive? 
um, just every last aspect of your day is affected. Um, and I think, you know, we all, especially like as a surgeon, I mean, I'm obsessed with sterility and all that. And it's so difficult to maintain that right now. Um, and not be worried about passing things from one patient to another and being the vector for people. Um, and it's just, like I said, it's very, very different than anything we've ever done. Um, I, you know, everyone talks about MRSA or, you know, the resistant staff and that's just something as healthcare workers, we all know we're colonized with now. Like even if you tried to treat us, we'd be colonized again tomorrow. Um, and so yes, it's a scary bacteria, but it's something we know how to treat. And this is just drastically different. Um, so I think those are kind of some of the things, and, you know, you mentioned too, just like our, our amount of PPE that we need and we don't currently have, but hopefully it will be coming soon. Um, you know, that is, that makes it even scarier. You don't know if you're adequately protected. Um, you're trying your best to protect yourself, but really what we're all thinking is, okay, if I protect myself, how do I protect the next person that I see? And, um, you know, especially if we start running low on PPE. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the big scary part is, you know, we're used to just being able to put some gloves on and um, that kind of thing just to protect ourselves and the next patient. And I know some hospitals in New York that they're, they've been instructed to like keep the same gloves on if they're going to see somebody with the same infectious disease, which I think is just crazy. And yes, I see that PPE is personal protective equipment. Sorry. <laughs> it's something we all talk about all the time and especially right now. So I forget to um, outline that for you guys, but um, it's, those are, there's a lot of different aspects that are really hard right now. Um, hopefully we're going to be learning a little bit more um, about it as obviously we get more data, especially coming out of Europe. I think all of us are a little concerned about China's data now. Um, it doesn't seem to fit basically anyone else's data. And, um, but we are still getting some good um, information about the virus itself, how it acts, what it is, just scientific bench research that we can use to try to figure out how to treat it. Um, and hopefully in a way we will have been blessed that we weren't the first to have this, um, that will be not necessarily the last, obviously, but um, I think it would be, it's nice to know that everyone else has had it because we're getting a lot of information. We're getting a lot of data. We're getting small clinical trials to help us figure out how to treat people. Um, and so hopefully that will help us keep our numbers or at least our mortality rate a little lower. Um, although if you look at New York right now, it's hard to say that that's going to be true. Uh, but, you know, I think the big things that we're all worried about is <laughs> we've been hearing about it for a month now of like, oh, it's coming. Oh, it's coming. Oh, we're a couple weeks behind Italy. Well, the entire United States was a couple weeks behind Italy. So then if you think about, you know, New York being a couple weeks behind Italy, well, then we're probably a couple weeks behind New York, um, at least here, like in the Dallas area. So I think that part has been really hard is just constantly knowing that something terrible is coming, but not really knowing when. Um, and, you know, just trying to extrapolate data to try to do our best to ramp up before then. Um, you know, thankfully we are going to be turning our convention center into um, like a COVID um, ward for the, for lack of a better term and trying to be prepared with, um, you know, not building military hospitals, um, like after the fact when you already need them all, but beforehand and trying to do all these things that Italy said that they ended up doing, but can we get that all in place beforehand and make sure our infrastructure is ready. And right now, all of our data points to basically North Texas should be affected uh, around like April 6th should be our like major surge. Um, obviously that changes day to day. It's hard to say, you know, that 
social distancing isn't working. We had a couple days where our rate of rise, like how many new cases we got actually came down, but typically that happens right before the weekend. And then on Monday, the number really jumps again. So um, I think we still have to keep that in mind. And as long as our rate of rise is staying low, then we shouldn't see any major issues with this until the end of April, as far as capacity goes. And hopefully by then, some of our first patients will be out of the hospital and that would be ideal. Um, but, and, and hopefully we'll have experienced a little bit of the flattening of the curve as opposed to a massive peak. But if our rate of rise stays kind of where it has been the last week or so, then we're looking at April 6th through 13th really being um, difficult. And uh, even, you know, at Grapevine, we could potentially see some of that a little earlier just because we're a slightly smaller hospital that still serves a pretty large population. Um, so that's kind of hard to guess, um, like which hospitals might be overrun beforehand. But as, a, um, as an area of the state, we should be looking sometime after April 6th um, when things really start to get stretched as far as how many hospital beds we have and whatnot. I think what scares me about the convention center being um, turned into a COVID ward, I think it's awesome, but um, I'm concerned about where we're going to get the physicians and the healthcare workers, especially if all of us end up exposed at work, then our numbers for our own hospitals are already low. And then you obviously, if you're sick, can't go volunteer over there. Um, if you're quarantined, you can't volunteer down there either. So I think that's the big concern is it would be great to kind of um, cohort them all together, but are we going to have the appropriate staff? Um, so, I that's those one of my are issues. big things. Yeah, that's one of the things that I'm concerned about. I mean, if I'm needed, I'm needed, but uh, I I don't go to the hospital by choice right now. But right. Um, you know, I'm just thinking that at some point, you know, they're going to need a pulmonologist. And, uh, and you know what, if they do, I'll go. Right. That's yeah, just what and we have to I, do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think too, like, you know, even our hospital system sent out a survey um, last week sometime, I think, asking people like in the community, community physicians, like what your skill sets are, how long has it been since you've seen a patient in the hospital? Are you comfortable what are you comfortable seeing basically? Um, essentially, can you run some shifts in the ER if we need you, um, especially from like family medicine, uh, physicians, urgent care, um, even outpatient internal medicine, those kinds of people are great to have in the ER if we need them. And then obviously backing up the rest of your front lines, like our ICU physicians. Um, and then I'm a surgical intensivist, so I will end up backing up the pulmonologist and the medical intensivist soon. Um, and so then who's going to take my patients? And so it's just this constant like conveyor belt of physicians, like bringing them up the line to things that they haven't done in a very long time. Um, I've seen a lot of great information though, coming from some of the Facebook groups on um, COVID, like how to treat it, um, short little primers for people that haven't touched a ventilator in years. Um, there's a lot of good information just trying to kind of quickly educate the masses. And um, I think that's good because I have, you know, ophthalmologist friends that they've already been asked, like if they can do a hospitalist shift. And granted, they wouldn't be seeing the COVID patients, but they could certainly help with somebody you know, otherwise. Um, same thing with dermatologists. Anybody that's basically done, you know, an internal medicine internship or a general surgery internship, you've seen the whole hospital. Um, we know you've touched a vent before and any kind of help um, you can get, but it, I think it's really scary for the physicians to be doing things they haven't done in a decade or more, most of them. Um, and, you know, what does that really say for patient care down the line? But I know we're not unique in that. Um, Italy's definitely in that situation. I know um, some orthopedic surgeons and even a pathologist that was helping on the COVID wards there because eventually it becomes the whole hospital from everything we can see because um, it just starts doubling so quickly that you can't do anything but take care of the COVID patients. And apparently COVID presents... Um, like 
a lot of different things that we're used to seeing. Um, there's a lot of heart attacks with COVID. Um, apparently it can, you know, present as like abdominal pain. So we think it's appendicitis and that could be possibly COVID. So um, it's good to have all of us on board um, with everyone's different expertise. We've had a couple of questions come in that uh, we want to see if we can try to get to. One is, um, do y'all have any opinions on Judge Jenkins' advice? I haven't heard this yet. Uh, to take elderly parents out of retirement living nursing homes. Um, <clears throat> I would not, well, a nursing home, you know, uh, I think Andrew Cuomo said, uh, nursing home in COVID is a, is just a, uh, um, it's like a spark on gasoline. Um, I would not move anybody at this point. Um, you know, I think you do more damage moving people rather than uh, keeping them where they are. Most of the, you know, one of the things that I do, one of my lay ministries is I do a, uh, I do a Sunday service at uh, the Legacy at Willow Bend, which is a large uh, retirement community in Plano. And uh, I was supposed to preach there a few weeks ago. And I, uh, I basically said in the middle of the week, I don't think we should be gathering. I don't think we should be bringing people in from the outside. Uh, I've kept in touch with some of the people that I know there, that I'm friends with there, and they've been doing okay. They keep, you know, they have no visitors. And I think those kind of situations are a bit safer. Uh, so I wouldn't move anybody. Yeah, I'm kind of of that same thought. I mean, especially people with dementia and that kind of thing, you're going to end up with them coming home to being in environments that they don't know. Um, their dementia can very acutely worsen in that respect. Um, I, I understand the, the thought behind it because like you said, it's, it's a spark around gasoline in a nursing home right now. I mean, if one gets it, most of them are going to get it. It's very bad for the elderly. Um, but you know, you can do a lot of damage by moving somebody so acutely without everything kind of happening. And the last thing you want is them to end up in the hospital with a broken hip, as opposed to at a nursing home where there was never a case of COVID. So. And, uh, and Brittany, you've been doing some work around, um, uh, mask, uh, mm -hmm. production. Are these actually useful to healthcare workers right now? So I think the big thing is, um, um, we know even if we have adequate PPE right now, we are not going to have it for long. Um, even if we get another huge shipment in, in the next week, it, we're just going to start go, going through things more quickly as we see more patients. Um, and so part of it is it's great for the patients that come into the ER that are technically well, and they're not necessarily there for COVID. If they have a mask that they can then keep with them their entire hospital stay, that's a really good thing um, because then they're protecting themselves and or if there is any suspicion it's just like if we are suspecting them at all we can protect them um, I know there's a lot of concern on if they're actually helpful yes it is next to impossible to hand make like an n95 at home and um, ideally we would all be wearing n95s but um, you know if you're just trying to like see patients and you're just going through hallways and that kind of thing. I think it's useful. Um, the more we're finding out like from South Korea, I think everyone having a mask was probably a good idea. So like I said, they're great for like the well patients. And then, you know, in the ER, if you do have an elderly person that's in the emergency room, um, you can have one person with them at least initially. Um, and that person definitely needs to be protected because you don't know who you're going to see out in the waiting room, that kind of thing. So while we can't necessarily um, say that they're great for the healthcare workers, they're great for everyone else that we need to provide a mask to so that then we can still use what we do have. And we only get one in 95 per shift. So it's nice to be able to cover them up with homemade masks. So there's that too. Wow. Uh, and uh, Cami is asking, um, are patients with COVID-19 and um, in a unit able to have their phones or devices that could connect them since there is going to be so much isolation? 
yes, as far as I know, we are not taking away any of their personal belongings. Um, and in fact, we're encouraging them to bring their phones and whatnot. I mean, we can't, their phone, as long as it's not leaving the room, isn't going to infect the rest of the hospital. Um, everything is getting wiped down more than usual. Um, and, you know, I know some places were moving towards like where you couldn't even have your partner there if you were delivering, um, like for pregnancy. And that just seemed awful. Um, but uh, yes, they can have phones. Um, and I've encouraged anyone, if you end up in the hospital, to take those things with you, like an iPad or something, so that you can video with people at home. Um, and especially if you're like over on labor and delivery, you're going to be um, limited to visitors much more so than what we're used to. And so when you want grandma and grand, you know, everybody to, meet the baby a lot of it's going to be unfortunately over the phone right now well thank you and uh and kathy sweeney has a question about uh, the k bailey uh, convention center being used as a COVID 19 hospital uh, what's going to happen to the homeless shelters that were using it for overflow that may be a question for um some of our colleagues that are more in touch with homeless issues but You'll have yeah, I haven't really heard. I know I've been really concerned about our homeless shelters because they have all essentially been full lately. Um, and like I even like even the women's like domestic abuse shelters, um, they're all, all completely full, all of them. Um, so if one person in those, they're they're kind of like a nursing home. We only need one person in them to get sick, uh, and then the whole shelter can get sick. And um, I'm very concerned about that. And I. But yeah, you would have to kind of talk to some of the homeless outreach to see kind of how they're moving that around. I mean, the convention center is huge. I think they could maybe figure some of that out, but obviously it's the ins and outs and cross-contamination that you're worried about. Great. Well, I think that, um, yes, so Kathy's going to check with MDHA um, to see. And uh, Kathy, if you're still on, I hope you'll communicate back with me just so we can, can spread that news around. Um, Judge Jenkins said that they will operate at the same time. There's room enough for both programs is what S. Diana uh, has, has uh, found out. Um, and actually, so there's a question that, uh, Jessica, we're going to get to that uh, on Wednesday about uh, asking hotels for five rooms for shelter purposes. Okay. So um, we have a couple of things that we'd like to do. Um, there are a couple of follow-up questions, but then uh, we're going to switch switch gears um, for us to think about the role of pastor in these situations, particularly with the the kind of isolation that we're we're talking about here um, and what's to come. Uh, because I know that some of some of our pastors here are already seeing some of their um, congregants and neighbors and loved ones uh, in the hospital, and, uh, and that's already a factor. Um, so, uh, Dr. Joseph, the, you had mentioned loneliness fatigue, um, and Dr. Brittany, I know both of you have talked about ahead of time as things have been progressing, that it's so important for us to stay home and to try to flatten the curve. Um, but you had mentioned this fatigue or uh, thinking that, oh, well, this actually might not be helping as the numbers start to rise. Could you speak more to that? Sure. I, w one of the things that happens is that when you look at the time of inf infection to the time that people get tested or people get uh, hospitalized and you continue to see these numbers rise, um, I think one of the problems is that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we live in a society where we, we, uh, have next day delivery. And so people are staying home and doing what they're supposed to do. And so they want to see that make a difference. Uh, the problem is that there's probably at least a good two week lag between uh, some of the community things that we're doing, you know, the social distancing and things like that. Um, there, there's a big gap between when we start doing that and when we do that really well and, and the results that we're going to see uh, down the line. Um, and, and so I think that people will get frustrated with being at home and, uh, and feel like uh, it's not doing anything. If you look at the medical models, uh, some of the, uh, the, the peaks for this are 
are looking about, uh, you know, uh, two to four weeks out. Um, you know, those numbers obviously, uh, uh, as Brittany was saying, they, they change all the time. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a, this is going to be a long time where we're going to have to just stay home and we're going to have to be very, very patient uh, to know that what we're doing by staying home and social distancing is having an effect, you know, on flattening the curve or on, you know, uh, allaying the spread of, of, the, of the virus. Uh, and I, I just think getting that word out to people to let them know that this we're in it for the long haul and what you do today may not have an effect for a couple of weeks, uh, but it's that much more important to, uh, to maintain that, that social distancing and that staying home. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, um, we're all kind of getting mixed messages on, you know, if we socially distance, then we're all going to be great in a couple of weeks. And that's not really at all um, how it's going to work. It, what we do today is something that at the earliest we could possibly see an effect is basically five days. Um, but truly, like he said, it's about a two week um, lag period. So when the area basically did a shelter in place on the 24th, we're not going to even see the effects of that until April 7th. Um, and so it's hard to, as like, as the public to say, yeah, well, I'm staying home and I'm not sending my kids to the park and I'm not doing play dates and I'm, my kids have cabin fever and so do I, and is that worth it? Um, it is really hard to prove that, especially like you said, when we are a immediate results society, um, we're used to everything kind of being right at hand and we truly have to be patient with this. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to be a short period, unfortunately. And I think um, we are going to get into a situation where we may even see like ups and downs where we can kind of release the restrictions and then we're going to have to put them back in place. Um, just kind of seeing how numbers go until we know a little bit more about do we become truly, you know, immune if we have it, that kind of thing. Um, we, we have a lot of questions about how long we're going to be socially distancing as a society, which is just not what any of us are used to. Um, sure, we are less connected because we're digitally connected, but we still spend a lot of time in large groups together, and we're really going to have to limit that for quite some time for it to truly help. Yeah, I, I think the really interesting thing about, um, about this situation is that, you know, you know as a nation, we, we've uh, dealt with disasters, uh, a number of disasters. Just look at the last 20 years. Start with 9-11. 9-11 was one day, was one morning uh, when a whole bunch of people were killed and a nation was, was shocked. Um, but what happened is at the, the very next day, we started dealing with the disaster. We started to come back from the disaster. If you look at a hurricane, uh, we have hurricane models that predict where the hurricane is going to go, and we have a certain amount of time for preparation. And then that disaster happens, the hurricane or the tornadoes go through, and then immediately we're in, uh, you know, disaster recovery mode. One of the really strange things about this is that, you know, this is a disaster that's coming. And as Brittany said, we haven't even peaked yet. Uh, we, you know, we have in this area we haven't peaked. New York is is starting to hit a peak. You know, I think one of the difficult things or one of the differences between New York and here. I, I used to live right outside of New York. I grew up outside of New York. New York is a is a city that runs on mass transit. The people are very jam packed together. I think that's one of the reasons it's a hot spot. We we live here. You know, from an urban studies standpoint, we live in a in a in a in an automobile. Um, you know, a city that, that uh, grew up around automobiles. So we, we, we go everywhere in a car, not so in New York. But, you know, this is a disaster where we, we haven't even hit the peak yet. Uh, so it's like watching 9-11 in slow motion or uh, a hurricane in slow motion, not just over hours or days, but we're talking about weeks, maybe perhaps even months. Uh, and, and the level of stress, you know, even, you know, knowing what I know and, and, I don't know, maybe it's more stressful for us because of what we know, but we've been waiting for this to start rising and for this peak uh, to happen. But um, 
it, it's just, it's a disaster in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that only a pandemic can do. Nothing else will do that. And it's, uh, it's, it's one of the things that makes it very, very strange for all of us. And I think too, something that, yeah, I mean, everyone keeps comparing this to wartime and I completely understand why. Um, for healthcare workers, it very much feels like you're going to war every day. Um, and I think too, other than 9-11, really here on our own soil in the United States, there are very few of us still living that have ever experienced war, even not on our own soil, but much less you know, I mean, it's been seven generations or more since we've experienced it on our own soil. So we have no idea what it truly means to like shelter in place and stay home. Um, our grandparents don't even truly understand that, not in our own homes. Um, and so I do think for the United States, um, we have been lucky to never be truly a war-torn nation um, in more than 150 years. And I think to like just not having, um, you know, a long drawn out war on your own soil, whereas Europe has all experienced that a couple times. Um, <clears throat> even, and there are still some people living from all that. Um, they understand that need to stay home for a long period of time to keep your family safe. Um, and that's just, that's something very new for Americans. And um, I think we've all been incredibly blessed up to this point not to have to deal with that. But it, it is such a novel concept for us to have to patiently wait for whatever we do today to have an effect. Um, and we do and we tend to come together as a community um, when disaster happens. And right now we're all being told to separate ourselves, which is the exact opposite of what we really want to be able to do for everyone. Um, and so uh, trying to reconcile that in your mind um, and your heart and all of that, I think is equally difficult. Um, so it's going to be, again, it, it's getting the public and everyone to understand that this probably isn't something that's going to be over in a month um, or even a couple of months. And um, that truly by staying separate is how we can be, you know, in solidarity with each other. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both for your time this morning. Um, we have a couple of questions that uh, I'd like to get to y'all um, separately. Um, uh, Cami, uh, I think it would be really important for us to kind of break into um, some hangout groups for us to, to think about how we're going to approach this pastorally as leaders. Um, uh, Brittany, uh, Joseph, y'all are, are welcome to stay uh, if you want, but um, also know if you can't need to move on to, to more important things um, uh, since you're taking care of folks. Um, but Cami, would you kind of introduce um, this conversation. Sure, sure. Um, so first of all, I, I want to say thank you to both of you as doctors and the kind of ways you bring healing to our communities and people. Um, it's such a gift to us and I can't tell you how much we give thanks for you and your colleagues and nurses and all that work with you. So thank you so much. Um, uh, one of the things I was kind of listening for is um, you know how can we be supportive of you all um, and w the things I wrote down that I heard you say and if you can say want to say anything more specifically I certainly would be happy to hear it but uh, I heard you say stay stay separate be a part of um, being sheltered so that it doesn't get spread that's one of the things I heard you say I heard you say um, be patient um, and and try to um, go deep to a place that um, we can even model patients so that others um, might also be able to experience that in us. Um, and, and, and connected to that, that just to recognize that there's uh, not going to be immediate results connected to patients. Um, can before I get um, moving on, can I? Do you all have anything else that you could tell us that you think would be helpful to uh, the medical field uh, personnel 
that we as pastors can do. You know, I, I've been, I've not been in, like I said, I've not been uh, regularly in the hospital for the last couple of years. Um, I'm, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of, um, you know, clapping and things like that. Hmm. But this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I know the vast majority of my colleagues, we do this out of love. Mm -hmm. uh, we do this out of ministry, out of calling. And the difficult thing for me uh, personally um, has been the physical isolation, you know, um, since I had a, a person in my office who, uh, may have been COVID positive. I, I've been, um, isolating myself. I mean, I'm still in my house with my wife and, uh, my son and daughter, in law but I sit alone in a room. Right, right. And I'm, I'm planning on potentially moving out if I have to go back to the hospital. And Brittany, I don't know what you do with your kids and, and you know, how you feel about this at home, but the social isolation for us, you know, um, I can see that if I end up going back uh, and working and I'm willing to do that, if, if it need be, I'll have uh, the camaraderie of my colleagues. Um, but I know that I'll be more isolated from my family. Yeah, I think that's our biggest fear. Like you said, I think all of us felt a calling to medicine. Um, I think a lot of us are having a hard time saying, well, I signed up for this. I don't think any of us signed up to be at the front lines of a pandemic. Um, I don't think any physician ever signed up to necessarily deal with that, not even infectious disease doctors. Um, but, you know, I, and I, I certainly don't think we signed up to be in situations where we may not be as protected as we think we should be, those types of things. Um, but most everyone I know, there's no way you're, they're not going to go take care of patients. They'll figure out a way to protect themselves. They'll order their own PPE off of Amazon and wait for two weeks. Um, I mean, I, I don't know anyone that when push comes to shove isn't actually going to go in and take care of people, but it's coming back home that is so different. Even now, even though we don't have, um, on my service, on the trauma service, we had, we have not had a positive patient yet. Um, we know they're in the hospital. We know we probably walk right by their emergency rooms, um, all of that. And so my husband is actually also my partner at work. So we both do the same thing. Um, there's a, we have a huge fear of bringing home this virus to our kids. Um, we are lucky to have a nanny, but what if we bring it home to her and then she's out? Um, we, you know, especially with the newest data all the time about kids possibly being just as involved as the rest of us, that's really scary. Um, and we already change scrubs more often than we used to. Um, we, change before we ever leave the hospital. We wipe down every last surface. I mean, I, I wipe down my steering wheel, my badge, my phone, my pen, anything that might have been in the hospital with me and then coming home and then I've touched. Um, and then we take our shoes off at the door and we try not to touch the kids um, until we've at least washed our hands and 
that kind of thing. Um, again, you know, and it's not like we don't wash our hands right before we leave the hospital. So it's hard because we don't get to enjoy that, um, moment of when your kids come running up to you at the door. Um, sometimes you just have to kind of put a stop to that. And that's really hard. We have young kids, my daughter's two and a half and my son is three months old. Um, I obviously can't not touch him. And, um, if we do start taking care of COVID patients, if one of us does get sick, um, most likely both of us will get sick. And all we can hope is that we're part of the 80% that only has something mild. Um, and that we, I mean, there's a real fear, I think, for some of us, especially dual physician homes, that what if we orphan our children? Um, I don't think about that a whole lot, or at least I try not to, but it's a legitimate concern. Um, and you do feel like a pariah in your own home. Like you just, you, you don't want to bring this stuff back. Um, you don't want to get anybody else sick. Uh, you know, those of us that are healthy and young, hopefully we don't get anything terrible. Um, but we know that not even those people are necessarily safe. So it, I mean, it definitely changed our family environment like overnight. And one once we start seeing more positive patients, it's really going to affect everything we can do. And so I think offering support for um, us as parents, not just as healthcare workers um, and as daughters, as anybody, you know, the person that takes care of the rest of the family, um, that's a big thing. And stepping in to help in those situations, if we are isolating ourselves, if we are moving out, if we are doing these things to try to keep other people safe is, you know, making sure our families are taking care of us when we can't be that person that normally that we're used to being. Um, and you know, we've had a couple friends here offer to make our grocery trips and that kind of thing so that, um, we don't have to expose ourselves any more than just being at the hospital. Um, and, but I think, like I said, just offering that support and that community of being willing to take take the reins for us if we need it. Um, and also just making sure that we are supported in an emotional way as parents, not just physicians or nurses or anybody like that. Okay. Thank well you. Said. Well Thank said. You. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I've been looking at all the pictures of my colleagues on, on this particular call. And I recognize that um, there was people, at different points, people were taking big, deep breaths. Um, I think taking it in. I, I saw um, folks who were uh, who I've known for years, who I know are great pastors, um, and some new faces that um, I know are uh, just eager to be present um, and do something. Um, you know, we we kind of can be action oriented. Um, people and, and as pastors we want to make things you know better um so one of the things that i i want to just lift up as we share you know move, move into some small groups is um for all of us to remember and and consider um, what the unique role is of the pastor um you know one of the things that I remember being said when I was in seminary is that we are like the priest in the community. You know, um, we, we, uh, we are expected in so many uh, ways to be the ones that think deeply about who God is, how God uh, interacts with the world um, and uh, what God is doing, um, how God shows up and um and how to access the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, as I think about that, um, I think about the fact that we uniquely ask those theological questions um, and then access God um, in, in our own uh, you know, needs, but also for others. And, um, so, you know, before I kind of move from that, uh, I wrote a piece that was placed on our website and it was about presence. 
And one of the things I didn't say, if you haven't read it, you know, I'll just give you a little short condensed version is uh, when I was a chaplain, I, I was a chaplain at Methodist Hospital for a couple of years. And um, it was such an important time for my own personal pastoral growth. Um, and it's important because I think one of the things that became clear to me was um, that, you know, God was already present in a patient's room or in someone's life, um, and that I, I wasn't God that I was the one who partnered with the Holy Spirit, with God, and connected to what, what the Holy um, was already doing. And if I listened to that, if I listened to and watched for where God already was, then I honored the Holy that was within someone else. Um, I honored the nurse that was bringing the holy healing touch, you know, to the patient. I honored the doctor who uh, was diagnosing and and doing the the hard work uh, that they do with the patients. Um, um, you know, I honored the family member who who brought in a, a prayer or encouragement, and in recognizing that all of us were part of the team, so that it wasn't just all sort of if I. I, I was thinking wrongly if I thought it was all sitting on me, right? Can we do that sometimes as, as pastors? Um, so, so re but it is important for all of us to recognize, um, you know, our role, our unique role as thinking deeply and spiritually about what is going on. Um, and I think connected to that is, um, you know, listening very, very intently for what people are asking for. You know, you can't, um, we sometimes go in with our prescri prescribed plan of what we're going to offer them or do to them or, um, and it's not, a, it's, it's not always a gift to them to have to bear our prescribed plan, right? Here's my thing I'm putting on you, um, but listen to what it is they're asking that, 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 that is a need. So um, what I started to say earlier about my piece on presence was I told a story about going into a hospital room because a nurse asked me to um, about um, offering, uh, as uh, listening to the patient who was screaming out, where is God? Um, and then sort of a holy spirit came upon me to just, speak some words of scripture that ultimately really brought her peace. Um, but what I didn't say in that story was that the whole time I was in her room, her eyes were closed. She never saw me. Um, and I was thinking, I asked that question about telephone or, you know, or cell phones and, and um, you know, other devices that you can connect to, um, you know, just, like, like right now, just a voice of, of um, asking a question that goes to a place of the heart. Um, and, you know, you all just saw how caring for somebody and asking what their need is, is, is a deep way of loving um, another person. And, and, um, and we don't always know what they're going to say. Um, and just listening, you know, is so important. So, um, so listening deeply uh, for what people are asking for, I think is extremely important and having empathy for the pain that somebody's feeling in the moment. Um, and then, you know, I think I'd offer this last thing, which is um, we also know a God that is a resurrected God. And that connects us really, really deeply to hope. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, it's ever uh, too, um, no, no, I don't, I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves and say, oh, it's all going to be okay. Or it's, everything's fine when people are saying, you know, it's not fine. It's really not fine. <laughs> 
and if we're not listening to them to them saying it's not fine um and just sitting with the fact that it really isn't fine um our ability to have patience in suffering is really important and so um uh, i think it's okay to sit with people and go yeah this is really crappy <laughs> um and i um painful it's awful it feels terrible um it's that's a, a way of being honest with what the realities are and um and my hope is that just knowing that someone loves you and cares enough for you or i love you and care enough for you will continue to help people um know they're not alone so um so I offer those things, um, and um, let me see if I have a couple other things. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, both the doctors said um, is how uh, it, how exhausting it can be to 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 carry the load, and um, and I was thinking a lot about a gift that I was given uh, years ago um, from. It was Brian Hardesty Crouch, who who um, said to me, "You might want to utilize the Saint Ignatius prayer, which is and, and at the end of the day, uh, Lord, I give this to you, and anything that comes to your mind, any worry that you have, any person that you've been caring for, any um, you know, just offload every single thing that you've been carrying on your shoulders." Um, and, and I remember doing this and thinking, I had no idea all the things I was carrying on my shoulders until I started, un, um, you know, unloading and unloading and unloading. And I can't imagine that for doctors that that might also be the case that, um, you know, you, you shove things deep down. Um, but there's a God that carries our, our, uh, the pain of the world. And, um, and we can give that, uh, our, our cares and concerns, our worries about people to God. And really, if we do that, then we're actually giving them a gift because we're prayerfully offering them deeply up to God. So um, I offer that as uh, something, someone who spiritually gave me that gift um, to, as a practice. The other thing I would say is consider enlisting colleagues to support you and um, to offer backup. I was thinking particularly about, it, uh, you know, as Brittany was talking about this and as Joe was talking about how we could be slammed in a couple weeks and the next month um, with pastoral care and funerals. Um, have a, have, think the same way that the city's thinking about care. Think about who your team is that's gonna help you when you get slammed with um, doing this pastoral care with funerals, particularly, and who can, who can be a part of your team. Um, and then I was also thinking about utilizing parishioners. Um, yesterday, my husband's a pastor, just for those of you who don't know. And yesterday, my, my husband um, said, you know, we need some folks who might be willing to, to go ahead and send out um, uh, deliver school supplies to kids because um, he's connected uh, to a church member who's uh, Plano uh, Independent School District su uh, superintendent uh, superintendent schools and um, oh my, my gosh within 30 minutes people were you know socially distant but lining up at the church to get supplies they want to be useful in care and so maybe there's some systems or ways that we could multiply pastoral care through phone trees. And um, you guys, I'm sure, are already doing those things because you are very smart and pastoral people. But those are some suggestions. Um, and I think um, that's those are the practical things I, I'd offer. Um, but really mostly to be very thoughtful and um, spiritually attuned to what you're called, um, what God's calling you to, 
to do and be in the moment. So that's what I have to offer. Um, do you, Andrew, do you want to take it to divide it up or is there anybody? Yeah. Else? Well, I wonder if we could also um, uh, say a prayer for um, these doctors and their colleagues before we, uh, before we go. Kevin was, was good to uh, do that deep listening with us um, on chat and, uh, and recommend that we pray for them specifically. Um, could you do that, Cami? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for Joe and for Brittany and for their colleagues and spouses. And we ask your blessing on the work that they are doing and in their lives. We pray for all of the hospitals um, in, in, in the world, really, but particularly for our local hospitals and those who are serving um, all persons who come to be treated. Lord, I pray that you will continue to give them strength, um, continue to help them in their fatigue and in their fear. Um, give them courage, Lord, and help them to be wise. Lord, we give you thanks for the gifts that you have given them, the gifts of healing and walking alongside people. We give you thanks for the ways, Lord, they've already made a difference in the world and in their communities. And Lord, we pray for their children. We ask your blessing, particularly on um, Brittany's small children. We ask your blessing on um, Joe's family members who are living with him. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen them. And thank you for giving them to us as partners on this journey. Uh, Lord, may we continue to hold them st uh, strongly in our prayers. And um, as we think of the doctors, nurses, caregivers that we are all related to through our churches and our communities and our neighborhoods, Lord, we lift them up to you. We ask your blessing upon them. We ask for your courage. Help us, Lord, be pastors, priests in the community. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Cami. Uh, so before we, uh, I wanted us to have some time to be able to talk with one another. I mean, part of this is because of the, the isolation that you know so many of us feel. Um, and while we can't be together uh, face to face, at least we can have some time uh, together to share about this role of pastor and and how we're approaching it individually. So I'm going to send us into some breakout groups through the magic of Zoom. Um, and I'm going to give us a couple of questions uh, that will you'll be received in these breakout groups. And we'll have about um, eight to ten minutes to just talk with one another. And here are the questions. What scripture, experience, or teaching is informing you as you prepare for this pastoral work ahead? And then, you know, practically speaking, what can you do to make sure that those who need pastoral care in your community uh, and in your congregation are able to receive that care? Uh, what are the things that you can do? Uh, like Cami was saying, um, you know, call upon those that can help us that uh, are in our sphere. Um, so I'm going to send us into some breakout groups and we'll gather us back together here in about eight minutes. As we're gathered here uh, back together, I just want to thank you uh, for your time today. Um, what I've uh, noted here in our uh, chat box is uh, John Wesley's A Primitive Physic, uh, which is uh, a text that John Wesley created um, that was actually on the frontier uh, America, uh, was the most popular and widely distributed book, uh, even more so than the Bible, um, that was a list of basically um, medical cures, not all of them, uh, most of them are probably kind of quackery um, by our standards today, uh, but John Wesley in his Wesleyan movement was concerned about the public welfare and public health, and so as we go about our uh, work 
as pastors, as uh, theologians and residents, and wearing our many different hats, we are also um, public theologians and caring for the public health of our uh, common soul and souls here in um, the communities we serve in across uh, this country. And so I want to thank you for your uh, work day in and day out. Um, and if you have any further questions, please uh, email me uh, at Pfizer at ntcumc.org for any follow-up questions that you might want to get to our medical professionals uh, or others about missional response. Uh, you'll note that there are a number of other uh, Zoom calls happening today and throughout this week. On Wednesday at 10 a.m., we will have our um, a Zoom call that is like our one last Monday, where, where we'll share about uh, some of our rural missional responses and have kind of a time of resourcing and uh, sharing one another um, uh, about things that we're seeing on the ground in terms of our own missional response and getting some um, connections uh, and leveraging some of the things that we're already doing. Um, so that'll be 10 o'clock on uh, Wednesday morning. So we'll hope you'll join us uh, with that. This conversation will be uh, recorded, edited, and um, it's gonna be up on our website as soon as we're able, as long as some kind of summary notes to help guide our conversation. Um, J.D. Allen <laughs> says uh, some of our uh, public uh, work may be helping to folks to avoid the kind of quack cures that people seem to be uh, taking cues from from our president. Um, and uh, Kimmy has also included her email as being a conversation partner. Again, if you're having uh, you know, major questions, you'll want to be in touch with your district superintendent, and all of us are available uh, here for your conversation. All right, thank you very much. Kimmy, do you have anything to add? No, just to thank you for all of you guys um, and all the ways that you pastor. Um, I'm aware that uh, my husband's um, church uh, divided up on the staff well, and called every single member on. just to check I would send in. us with this uh, benediction that is uh, known to many of you. Let us go forth from this uh, digital space, uh, loving God in all that we do, so that those for whom uh, hope and love are a stranger in this time and isolating time uh, will find in us most generous friends. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Thank you all for doing this.